my life I give, henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Promises that we're making to God, do we really mean it as we sing them? Please take your Bibles and turn over to Acts chapter 28. Tonight we're looking at part 4 of All Here, But Only Some Believe. Acts 28, I'll begin at verse 17. And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men, brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of, for this cause therefore have I called for you, to see you, and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that it is everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Gracious Father, we pray that once again you will open our eyes to understand that which you have written for us, so that we might know the Lord Jesus Christ and know him better, and all the work that he has done, his finished work and what it has accomplished, the way in which it has an interplay with eternity past and eternity future, the way in which it affects us here in time present. We pray, Father, for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you know, the last time we were here in Acts chapter 28 was back on June 11th, because on June 18th was Father's Day special, Faith of Our Fathers. Then there was Youth Rally Sunday with guest speaker, uh, Reverend Keith Coleman, where he preached on playing church. Am I here to worship? And sadly, I did not uh, have anyone here tonight, who, well, that night, who recorded that, so I didn't get to hear it. I wish I had. And then on July the 2nd was Independence Day Sunday, Anthem for a Nation. And July 9th tonight, we're back to all here, but only some believe, part four. Now, the last time we were together, we have to tie a few things together because we've been talking about the doctrine of election. Now we're talking about the doctrine of predestination and the differences between those two doctrines in Scripture. So we're looking at the interrelationship of some of these key doctrines dealing with the choices that were made by the sovereign God in eternity past. First, we studied how the principle of accountability ties into the doctrines of election and predestination. We can't just say, well, because God predestined everything and God made all those elections, therefore we are not responsible, we are not accountable, you know, because it's going to be what we'll be. That's fatalism. That is not the doctrine of election, and that is not the doctrine of predestination. Fatalism is not a biblical doctrine, it's a pagan doctrine. What we're dealing with here is a personal God who has a personal relationship with people and to whom we are, in fact, accountable. And when we stand before him, we can't say, you know, like Paul gives the illustration in the book of Romans, can the pot say to the potter, why have you made me this way? No, of course not. We cannot blame God. We cannot say, well, God, you predestined everything, so therefore I should not be held accountable, because God will hold you accountable, and he can do justly so. Because we are all sinners, none of us deserve grace, none of us deserve heaven, none of us deserve anything good in this earth, we're all sinners, and without the saving work of Jesus Christ, every one of us will be headed for hell. And so the question is not, how can a loving God send anybody to hell? The question is, how can a righteous and just God send anybody to heaven? That is the real key. And that question has been answered by the cross of Calvary. 
The first question presupposes that we are good and that we deserve heaven. So to ask how can a loving God send anybody to hell misses the point because we start as sinners. We were born dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible says so. We are inheritors of Adam's sin. We were born with a sin nature and we sinned by choice after we were born. So not one of us deserves to go to heaven because one single sin will keep you out of heaven. Heaven is perfect. Heaven is righteous. There is no sin in heaven. Peter is not standing there winking at people as he lets them slide from the back gate while they throw a few more gold coins down on the golden pavement of heaven. It doesn't work that way. Sin separates us from God, and he is holy and he is righteous. So it's not how can a loving God send anybody to hell. It's how can a righteous God send anybody to heaven for we are sinners. And that question is answered by the cross of Calvary. God can send us to heaven justly and righteously because Jesus Christ paid for our sins on Calvary's cross. So now as we're looking at the doctrines of election and predestination, we want to see how they tie together and how they tie together with the principle of accountability. First, we looked at how the term elect is used in the Bible. We looked at that in many, many different passages, you recall, and we saw that it not merely means to be chosen, it has something additional to it. It means being chosen to accomplish a specific purpose. There is purpose and goal when we are dealing with the issue of election. It is not only related to the doctrine of salvation, it is related to the divine plan of God, whereby he accomplishes his goal and for his moral creatures in every aspect of his universe. And his moral creatures include not only people, but it includes the entire angelic host. And within that entire angelic host, as you know, one third of them fell and followed Satan, and they are now what we call the demons. Two thirds followed God, and one third followed Satan, and there has been a long war against God all throughout the history of the universe. So election deals with purpose and plan of God in the choices that God makes. Election is not merely a question of God making choices. It refers to the fact that God makes choices with the most intricate and intense of purposes, and very precisely for bringing eternal glory to himself, for he is worthy. That helps us understand why elect and election are used in so many different ways in the Bible. What we've seen so far is Christ is called the elect, Israel is called the elect. The Jews who will be saved during the tribulation are called the elect. Believers in Christ at this time are called the elect. Churches are called elect churches. The unfallen angels are called the elect angels. The elect are no longer under the condemnation that falls on the non-elect. The elect have obligations as to how they will live. You can't just say, well, I'm elect, so I don't have to worry about it. God has given to those who have placed their faith in Christ obligations as to how they should live. God specifically appoints certain Christians to preach the gospel to the elect. We saw that election is tied to foreknowledge, but not to fatalism. Foreknowledge means that God knew all the possible scenarios and chose the one that most perfectly glorifies himself. It does not mean that God looked down the corridors of time and saw what would happen and chose on that basis, because that would make God subject to history rather than making history subject to God. Now, you know, we went over dozens of verses. I just summarized for you all the different ways in which the term elect is used in the Bible. If you looked up every one of the terms where the word elect or election shows up, it would fit under one of those categories that I just gave to you. Then we studied how election fits together with predestination. Now, those two terms are not identical. They are not interchangeable terms, although they're obviously welded together to form a comprehensive view of the sovereignty of God. Election deals with God making choices among the morally accountable parts of his creation, men and angels, to accomplish a specific purpose. God making choices among the morally accountable creatures, men and angels, to accomplish his specific purpose. That's election. Predestination. Now let's look at them side by side. Predestination deals with God determining in eternity past the ultimate, the ultimate destination, destination pre-destination. God, God determined, determined beforehand the ultimate, ultimate destination, destination of all of his morally accountable creatures. It's, it's different, different from, from, though obviously tied, tied together, together with, with the doctrine of election. Of election. Predestination, predestination deals with God determining in eternity past the ultimate, the ultimate destination of all of his morally accountable creatures, creatures both men and angels. angels. And, and as, as with the doctrine of election, 
God always has goals. He doesn't do things nonchalantly. He doesn't do things without purpose. There are purposes in the doctrine of election, and there are purposes in the doctrine of predestination. Goals in view that God has when we see that term used in Scripture. Ultimately, predestination relates to salvation because that's an ultimate destiny. But there are also other goals that God had planned for those for whom he has planned heaven. Salvation, the ultimate goal is heaven, right? That's where you want to go. When you trust Jesus Christ, you have a complete transformation in your life. You're changed from death to life, from darkness to light. Uh, you now have a hope, a purpose, a future, which you did not have before. Before, your only hope and goal was you were going to burn forever in the lake of fire. And now you have the guaranteed goal of heaven, and you are excited. You want to tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ and how he took their sins on himself at Calvary and died in our place. But there are some other goals that we find where, under the doctrine of predestination where God has planned for those uh, whom he has foreordained for heaven. For example, first, we find the New Testament doctrine of adoption is tied to predestination. Now, I'm not talking about you going down to some place and adopting some children. Uh, my daughter Anastasia has adopted four little boys, and they are a delight to me. And I went with them to China to adopt two of them, and later they went to Ukraine and adopted two more. Uh, but the principle of adoption, God has what is called adoption in the New Testament. And it's an, an adoption into God's family. You say, but I, I thought we had the new birth. Yes, that's also true. But as the Apostle Paul writes, he uses some terms that brings us back into the ancient Middle Eastern world whereby a child could be born into a family and so he's rightfully part of that family. But when he reached puberty, when he came to be like around age 12, his father would take him down to the local town council and there he would officially and legally adopt him, making him a legal heir to everything that the father had. So he was both a born son and an adopted son. And we find that the Apostle Paul speaks of the doctrine of adoption in relation to the doctrine of predestination, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. Here's what Paul writes. He says, having predestinated us, so there's predestination, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, the child didn't choose to be born. The child didn't choose to be adopted. It is the father who chooses to have the child born by impregnating the mother. And it is the father who would take the son down at the time appointed by the father to have him legally adopted and make him his legal heir. And that's what we see here, too. Why did God do this, predestinating us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself? It says, according to the good pleasure of his will. The will of God superintends and overshadows all that takes place in the area of salvation. We need to realize that God is sovereign, not man. We need to realize that God accomplishes his purposes, but man does not always accomplish his purposes. We need to understand that when the will of God is set against the will of man, the will of God always prevails. And so, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So the first thing we see besides salvation that is tied into predestination is the New Testament doctrine of adoption. We're children of God by the new birth, that's John chapter 3, and by legal adoption, whereby we are made legal co-heirs with Jesus Christ. That's a, That's a magnificent, magnificent wonderful, wonderful thought. thought. We are heirs, heirs together, together with him, him, says the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. The second thing that we find tied in to uh, the doctrine of predestination is the doctrine of our eternal inheritance. I hope you're taking notes on this, because this is a lot of good stuff that I'm giving you in a very condensed nutshell form tonight. So the second New Testament doctrine of our eternal inheritance is tied to predestination. We find it there in that very first chapter also of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. It says, in whom, that is, in Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after. And here we have that phrase again, the counsel of his own will. 
It is the sovereign will of God that accomplishes these things. It accomplishes our adoption. It is the sovereign will of God that accomplishes our eternal inheritance. You see, if you're a legal heir, that means that someday you're going to inherit something, right? Have any of you here ever inherited anything from anybody? Yes. We've all inherited something down the road. If we had somebody in the past who died who was close to us, they left us something. Did you know Jesus died? And he left us an eternal inheritance. He rose again, but he did die. And because we are now co-heirs with Christ, because of the legal adoption, that makes us co-heirs with Christ of the inheritance that he has gained for us. What a marvelous thought. And those are both tied into predestination. And obviously, the doctrine of Eternal inheritance is likewise tied to the doctrine of adoption because it is the legal heirs, those who have been adopted legally into the family of God, who receive the inheritance in any estate. Now we find another term in the New Testament that is used in relation to predestination, and that is the term chosen. That also expresses predestination, the ultimate destiny of men, angels, and nations, determined and guaranteed by God from eternity past. So let me give you a few of those. The term chosen is used of God's earthly people, the Jews. And we find that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'll give you just a few. There are many of them. But Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, for example. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Now who made the choice? for the relationship between God and Israel in the Old Testament. Was it Israel running around saying, man, we really want the God of the universe to be our God, but, uh, you know, we just can't get hold of him. Every time we call, the line is busy. Or was it God who made the choice for Israel? Was it God who reached down and pulled Abram out of the Ur of Chaldees and brought him to the land of Israel and ultimately changed his name to Abraham? and the name of his wife Sarai to the name Sarah. Was it God or was it Abraham who decided that there was a baby going to be born? Abraham tried with Hagar and he got a son, Ishmael, and there has been war between the Arabs and the Jews ever since then. But God gave him a son of promise, Yitzhak, Isaac, laughter when Sarah was 90 years old and Abraham was 100. God who does miracles. God is the one in control of that situation. That's not normal exactly. God is a sovereign God. And so the term chosen is used of God's earthly people. Thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. There was a purpose in the choice that God made. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Hey friends, that's us. God had a special plan for Israel. Now we get into some of that when we get into this age in which we live, the church. But God had a special plan for the Jews. And he still does. How about four, seven chapters later in Deuteronomy 14, 2? God says it again. For thou art unholy people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. You know, they're still viewed that way during the tribulation period. We find that in the New Testament, several different references. I'll give you just one of them. Mark chapter 13, verse 20. Jesus is speaking here. All of the discourse, he says, Except that the Lord had shortened those days, that is, the days of the great tribulation, and the Lord willing, when we finish the book of Acts, we're going to be looking at the book of Revelation, and all the incredible and exciting prophecies that are coming down the road toward us. But Jesus is speaking here, and he's talking about the great tribulation period, and he says, Except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, who he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Very interesting. I'm going to save a full exposition of that for when we get on to our studies in the book of Revelation. But the ones he's chosen, in the context, it's the nation of Israel. The rapture is already happening. The church is already gone. We're out of here. We're up at the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven. The great tribulation is happening on earth. The Antichrist has risen. The false prophet has risen. First three and a half years, everything seems to be fine. 
because the Antichrist has made a covenant with the Jews and they think everything is fine. And then at the halfway point, he sets up an image of himself in the temple and he requires everybody to worship him. And anybody who won't, is, or won't take his mark, either forehead or their hand, they're going to get killed. And Jesus warns about that. He says, when you see that happen, he says, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. If you're in the field, don't go back home. Run for the mountains. If you're on the house top, run as fast as you can. Get away. If you're with child, oh, man, you're going to be in trouble. Because this can be the worst tribulation the Jews have ever seen since the beginning of the world. And listen, folks, they've gone through some pretty heavy stuff. You think of Hitler's Holocaust. You think of the Babylonian and the Assyrian captivities. You think about all the scattering of the diaspora of the Jews to the various lands of around the world during the times of the Romans. You think of all the things they suffered in Poland, all the things they suffered in Russia. It's going to be worse than any of that. The term chosen is also used for the city Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem, which is the capital of God's earthly people, the Jews. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 21. If the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to put his name there be too far from thee, then thou shalt kill of the herd of Ev and of thy flock, which the Lord hath given thee, as I have commanded thee, and thou shalt eat in thy gates whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. So the place where God chose to put his name was what? Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. God put his name there. He put his name in the Temple Mount. He said, that's where my name will be placed. It's the apple of my eye. Anybody who touches the apple of my eye is in serious trouble. If somebody pokes you in the eye, does it make you mad? Anybody who touches the Jews, God calls them the apple of his eye. You poke him in the eye and he'll take vengeance on you. We find also some other passages, perhaps the most striking verses concerning predestination and salvation of these. For example, here's some verses for you to chop down. Predestination and salvation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. So who's he writing to? He's writing to Christians. He's writing to the church at Thessalonica. He says, man, I give thanks for you every time I think about you. You're beloved. You're my brothers. Because, now listen to this progression. God hath from the beginning... So it wasn't someplace down along the process from the beginning, all the way back in eternity past. God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Now, I don't know how you can cut that any other way. The people who get saved, they have nothing to boast about. I have nothing to boast about because it was God who made the choice first. I was dead in trespasses and sins. I could, I could not, not respond, respond to the realm of the spiritually living, neither could you. God had to reach down. He had to perform a work of faith and regeneration in my heart and in yours if you're saved. He had to open your eyes and ears to the word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You had to hear the word and the Holy Spirit had to open your mind to see this is the truth and irresistibly draw you and give you life and give you faith, give you regeneration simultaneously. So that you can be born into God's family and then be adopted into God's family as a legal heir with Christ. God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation and here's how he did it. The devil would have loved to kill you when you were a baby. You know what? He didn't get a chance. He's managed to kill a lot of babies. Those of you who were with us when we saw Anthem for a Nation on the 4th of July Sunday or Independence Day Sunday, a week ago, they told you how many people were killed in each of the wars. 400,000 in the Civil War, and 52,000 in the Korea War, and 54,000 in the Vietnam War. And they said, well, we'll drop one BB for every 10,000 people into a tin can so that you can hear what it sounds like when we drop the BBs in. And so they dropped them in for the Revolutionary War, they dropped them in for the Civil War, which was a lot more, and then dropped them in for the Korean War, and then for Vietnam, and you know, you hear ta 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 And then they said, and now here's World War I, and they dropped in a lot more, and here's World War II, and they dropped in a bunch more. 
And they said, and here's the number of babies that have been killed in the United States since Roe v. Wade came in. And they started pouring in babies. And they kept pouring. And each baby represented 10,000. And they kept pouring and kept pouring. It lasted almost 30 seconds. And you heard dozens of babies going Those are children whom the devil has blinded the minds of their mothers and others to murder. You're here tonight because your mother didn't do that. The devil would have loved to kill you while you were still a baby. But God did something to get you here and if you're saved to get you to salvation. It says, he not only chose you from the beginning, but he sanctified you by the Spirit. Sanctification doesn't mean he made you perfect. The word hagiadzo, which is what's translated here for sanctify or to sanctify or sanctification, means to set apart. God put a wall around you. He set you apart. Now, when we're dealing with the Christian life, sanctification deals with being set apart from the world around us, living a holy life. But we're talking here at the point of salvation. God is talking about sanctification or setting us apart by the Spirit of God. He put a wall around you so the devil could not touch you. Because, you see, he had an ultimate goal, which is explained in the last phrase of that verse. Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. The choice takes place first. The wall of protection takes place second. And God brings you to the truth. Causes you to believe. Those things have to happen for you to be saved. Very clearly we see some striking verses concerning predestination and the salvation. There are others too. For example, Matthew chapter 22, verse 14. Jesus is speaking and he says, For many are called, but few are chosen. The call goes out in general. It's heard by many, but only a few believe. We just read that, didn't we? Over in our passage in Acts chapter 28. Many are called, but few are chosen. We see the same thing in Matthew 20, uh, verse 16. The last shall be first and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. We find it in John chapter 15, verse 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. If Jesus had chosen you and pulled you out of the world, the world wouldn't hate you. But what does the history of the Christian church tell us about what the devil thinks about believers? What pagans think about believers? What those who are lost and headed to hell think about believers? They do not want to hear, they gnash their teeth, and they kill those who they can. Now, the disciples. Did they choose Jesus or did Jesus choose them? Obviously Jesus chose them. There were a lot of people who wanted to follow him. But there were 12 that he chose to have a special and close relationship with him. After Jesus taught the doctrine of predestination, it says many left him. They didn't want to hear it anymore. And Jesus says to the disciples, Will ye also go away? And then Peter says, Lord, thou hast the word of eternal life. To whom shall we go? It's not a popular doctrine. Even today among churchgoers, it's not a popular doctrine. I mean, if those people left Jesus, who was as clear as crystal, God of the universe, who absolutely knew what he was talking about, if they left him, do you not suspect that they would leave us? If you are of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, 
therefore the world hateth you. You say, okay, so when did it take place? I mean, when did this choice take place? Uh, maybe it was, you know, Jesus was walking around and thought, man, that looks like a pretty good candidate there. And actually, when you look at the disciples, none of them look like good candidates. But, uh, you know, let's pretend for a minute. He says, man, that guy looks pretty good. That guy looks pretty good. And then he rejects others. Like, you know, the rich young ruler who comes to him. The people who said, well, we want to follow you. And Jesus said, the, the, the fowl of the air have nests, you know. Foxes have their own little holes in the ground, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. They say, oh, on second thought, we think we'll go someplace else. Who chose whom? Jesus chose them, and he provided for them, and they were with him, and he taught them, and he sent them. This ragamuffin band of discontents to start the greatest movement the world has ever seen. And that's why we're here tonight. Because faithful man, man, taught faithful man, man, who taught faithful man, who taught faithful man, generation after generation, century after century, millennia after millennia, and we're here today. He chose them. They were not the ones who chose him. You, so you say, so okay, when did it take place? Well, we find that back in Ephesians chapter 1 also. Ephesians chapter 1 has a lot to say on this subject. But listen, it tells you when he made the choice. According as he hath chosen us in him, that is in Christ, that's his subject, whom he's talking about, chosen us in him, now here it is, before the foundation of the world. Is that a long time ago? I guess so. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us in Christ. And you know what? He decided what kind of people we were going to be. Listen to the next phrase. That we should be holy and without blame before him. And verse 4 runs into verse 5. In love, having predestinated us unto him, unto the adoption of sons to himself. That in love should actually be attached to verse 5. Because that's the reason God did it. Was because of his love. Now, let's now, talk let's about the flip side of that coin for just a second. So we find the election to salvation. But well, about, about the flip side, which is the doctrine of reprobation, that is, electing to damnation rather than electing to salvation. Or, more mildly put, as is put in the various confessions, passing over certain others. But reprobation is clearly stated also. John chapter 6, verse 70. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? That was Judas. John 13, 18. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. And Jesus pulled him in to the disciples, but Judas was on his way to hell. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. And he's speaking of Jesus as the one who is the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense. Jesus is the one who is the rock, not just Peter. Peter's a little pebble, but Jesus is the great rock. And he speaks of Jesus and he says, the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Now look at the last phrase. Whereunto also they were appointed. That's a pretty clear, plain statement of the doctrine of reprobation. In contrast to that, we have a different appointment in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So we find those who are appointed unto being disobedient and stumbling at the word versus those whom God has not appointed unto wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at a few more passages that refer to the Lord Jesus Christ when we deal with the doctrine of predestination. These are the passages dealing with predestination and Christ. For example, Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen. Now, we're quoting the book of Isaiah here. 
It's a quote by the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's a reference to Christ. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. The Lord Jesus Christ, spoken of as the servant of Jehovah, the one whom God has chosen, the one whom God calls his beloved, the one in whom God's soul is well pleased, the one that God says, I will put my spirit upon him, the one who God says, he will show judgment to the Gentiles. That's Christ, and he's spoken of as the chosen. We also find that there are various purposes for predestination stated in the New Testament. For we we'll give you a couple more verses related to Christ. Uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 35. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. They understood what Jesus was claiming. They understood he was claiming to be the Messiah. If he's claiming to be the Messiah, it means he's the chosen, the predestined one of God. And they're walking and say, okay, come on, prove it to us. <laughs> you think you're the chosen? Okay, come down from the cross. Save yourself. You saved everybody else, so come on, save yourself if you're the Christ, the chosen of God. We find Peter referring to it with the same words over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. To whom coming, that is, to the Lord Jesus Christ, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Christ, the chosen one of God and precious. Now, the various purposes which are also stated for predestination. If you are predestined, you are also predestined to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Listen to John chapter 15, verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. So you get the idea? We had that a little bit earlier. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. Okay, here's my purpose. I'm guaranteeing this is what happened. That you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Purposes for predestination. Number one, fruit of the Spirit. Number two, the gifts of the Spirit. We find in Acts chapter 1, the, uh, the ascension is about to take place. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. The apostolic gifts were given and are manifested immediately after this on the day of Pentecost. We find number three, specific positions of spiritual service are also predestinated. For example, and there are lots of these in the New Testament, Acts chapter 1, verse 24. And they prayed and said, Lord, thou knowest the hearts of men. Show whither of these two thou hast chosen. Remember they have cast lots for two, and the lot fell on Barsabbas. And it says, of these two whom thou uh, hast chosen, and the lot fell on one. Do you think God was in control of the lots between the two? Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, speaking to Ananias about Paul. For he is a chosen vessel unto me, and here's the purpose, a position of spiritual service, a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel a specific calling that God placed on Saul's, later Paul's, life. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27? And here's where it applies to us. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You see, God has a purpose in making these choices. He has specific spiritual service. He even chooses vessels that are really, basically, worthless. That's us. That's what it said here. It says he's not chosen many mighty, he's not chosen many noble. What has he chosen the foolish things of the world? God's chosen the weak things of the world. God has chosen the base things of the world. God has chosen the things that are not. 
If you're saved, perhaps, perhaps the reason that God chose you was because of that. I know that's why he chose me. Not because there was any good in me. Not because I was great. Because I'm not. But I was one of the most worthless things he could find. It takes a lot of pride out of us, doesn't it? We find another of the purposes or positions for spiritual service that God lists over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why did God choose us? To make us into a royal priesthood? To make us into a holy nation? To make us into peculiar people? So that we would show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light? That's one of the reasons for predestination, for spiritual service. We discover also that God has some qualifications that he gave and that he requires. When we're talking about predestination, here are some of the qualifications that God gave and that he requires. Acts chapter 10, verse 41. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses, he's speaking of the resurrection here, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. He chose specific people to be witnesses. Now, he's chosen you to be witnesses too, but apostolic witnesses are what we're dealing with here in chapter 10. How about chapter 15? Then pleased that the apostles and the elders of the whole church to send chosen men of their own company with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed named Barsabbas, and Silas, chief among the brethren. There's going to be some service taking place here. There's going to be some missionary work that's going to be going on. They've asked the Holy Spirit to designate which of the men should be going on this mission trip, and God reveals it to them. We find predestination in relation to specific new revelation. We find the Apostle Paul as he is standing before the Roman leaders, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee. He's quoting what happened to him in Acts chapter 9. The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. He was a chosen one to get new revelation. From, you know, not everybody in the New Testament got new revelation. Peter got some, John got some. The book of Revelation, in fact, the whole book of Revelation was given to the Apostle John. But Paul got most of the new revelation that's written down for us in the New Testament. We see some other verses. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 19. We're running out of time here. Not quite sure I'm going to get through all this, but we'll try. And not that only, but who was there also chosen of the churches to travel with us, with this grace which is administered to us to the glory of the same Lord and the declaration of your ready mind. God chooses those who will give. How about 2 Timothy 2.4? No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Have you been called into God's army? The answer is yes if you're a Christian. Have you been called to fight a spiritual war? The answer is yes if you're a Christian. Has God given to you spiritual armor, Ephesians chapter 6, that guarantees to protect you from all the wiles of the devil? The answer is yes if you're a Christian. And so there is a way that you, as a believer, are to be living because you have been chosen to be a soldier in God's army. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Why? He tells you why. It's sort of the same reason that when you have a, a platoon of soldiers and you're going to go out on a reconnaissance mission against the enemy, then when you, get, when you bivouac at night, you're going to... Uh, Set up your tents and stuff like that. You know, you don't have your soldiers setting off firecrackers to see how much fun it is. And you don't have them all laying around lollygagging and uh, drinking as much whiskey as they can possibly drink and singing at the top of their voices. You give your position away to the enemy if you do that. You make yourself incompetent and incapable of fighting if you do that. You have to please the one who's chosen you to be a soldier. You do not entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. In other words, you don't let it eat you up 
entangled, means to be tied up with. It's sort of like trying to walk through a gigantic cupboard. You've probably, some of you have seen those old great B horror movies back out of the 50s, you know, where some guy's walking through a cave and suddenly he walks into this spider web where it's got inch in diameter sticky stuff that is all over him. And suddenly this monster spider comes running down the web and begins to spin a web around him. And he's yelling and screaming for his companions to come and help him. The spider's getting ready to take a big bite and suck all his blood out. <laughs> That's the picture that's given. Entangle. You have to live in the world. You have to do things in the world because you're serving Christ. But you don't want to be entangled with the affairs of this life. Why? So that you can please him who has called you to be a soldier. How about James chapter 2 verse 5? Our time is up. We'll try to get at least two more. James chapter 2 verse 5. Hearken my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen, so who's doing the choosing? God is. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Remember what we read just a moment ago out of 1 Corinthians? God has not chosen all these rich and powerful and mighty men. He's chosen the foolish and base things of the world. The people who are nobodies. That Christ receives the glory. Not the people who had all this stuff and said, God chose me because I am so cool. I am so good. I am so rich. I am so powerful. God couldn't overlook me. Look at how good I am. That's why he chose me. No, God chooses the base things of the world. And James says the same thing as Paul. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith? Not rich in money. Rich in faith. When God looks down and he looks at people and he's looking for rich people, do you know what kind of rich people he's looking for? Not the people with the big bank accounts. He's looking for people who are rich in faith. How much do you trust him? That's what faith is all about. How much do you trust him? Do you trust him not merely to sort of generally provide for you, and but meanwhile you're going to do your own thing? Do you trust him as your very life? Do you trust him when you have an opportunity for witness, but you're scared? Do you trust him when you're hoping for something really big to happen in your life, and you know what you want to happen, but it doesn't happen? Are you rich in faith, or do you try to manipulate it and make it happen? The ones whom God chooses don't have to have a lot of money. All they have to have is faith. God has not chosen the rich ones. God's chosen the poor of the world who are rich in faith. And heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. I'll give you one final passage because our time is up. Look at Revelation chapter 17 verse 14. We find... The kings of the earth, they've decided to set themselves in array against the God of heaven. Revelation chapter 17, dealing with the harlot Babylon, says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him. If you're a believer, you will be with him. They that are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. Interesting. God's calling, God's choice, and faith all tied together. Those are the ones who will be with the Lamb. The one who is the final victor. The one who conquers all of the enemies of earth. With him are called and chosen and faithful. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you might make us that way. We will be not so much focused on the wealth of the world, but on the riches of faith. Teach us to walk by faith. And because we walk by faith, therefore to be faithful. We thank you, Father, for your sovereign purposes. We don't deserve it. Nobody deserves it. But in your wise and eternal sovereign plan to accomplish the greatest glory for yourself, 
You reached down and chose some very crummy objects, the base things of the world, the things that are nothing. So that no flesh could glory in your presence. None of us could say, well, we're here because we were so good. We're there because we were so bad that God is the only one who could clearly do anything for us. Thank you for your word, Father. We pray that you will bless it to the hearts of each who have heard it, and that you will bring forth fruit, for that is one of the purposes of those who are predestined. To bring forth fruit, that you will demonstrate and manifest through us the gifts of the Spirit which you have given, because that is one of your purposes. That you will cause us to be a light in the darkness, a testimony to the lost world, those who are unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For that is your design and purpose for those whom you have called and chosen and equipped to fight the spiritual warfare. And Father, we pray that you would make us faithful. For it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Your word declares that. And we pray that you might make it even so with us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.